principles which don't satisfy that definition. And once again, this is not some religious perspective. This is widely recognized in philosophy of science. Go to the bookstore and look at any philosophy of science textbook. You see, I think Dr. Irwin has, uh, has uh, begged a number of important questions. Notice in his characterization, uh, he describes the relation between theology and science and says that science uh, is trustful uh, of evidence, whereas theology is marginal. Uh, my question to Dr. Erwig, and I'm interested to, to discuss this, is what counts as evidence? If you are saying evidence has to be strictly empirical, you have just eviscerated most of science today. Quantum theory? I mean, I spent six years with nuclear reactors. In that entire time, I never actually saw fission. What I saw were instruments moving. They fit with what we understand nuclear fission to be. To say that science is strictly empirical is naive. It's naive. Science, yes, uses empirical evidence, but it's not sufficient to account for what science is. Scientists, uh, if you read any of, any of the guys who are writing in quantum theory, they're engaged in constantly mathematical formulas. Now, what are numbers? Well, let's do a thought experiment here. What I want you to do is think of the number two. Okay, is there anybody here that could not think of the number two? Now, what has happened when you think of the number two? What is the number two? Is the number two empirical? If I write the number two up here and then erase it, does that mean the number two disappears? What is the number two? It's an abstract. Now, the question is, is it a universal? And there are some philosophers who would actually argue that two is a social construct. I'm always interested to find who those are, because I'd love to get a hold of their checking account. <laughs> and if they're engineers, I would never want to fly in their plane. You see. Uh, so to suggest that science is strictly empirical is, is naive. Uh, uh, now once again, like I said, uh, he suggests, and I think actually Dr. Irwin is actually the one who's guilty of equivocation here, because on one hand he acknowledges, and I, I would agree, there are a number of different definitions of faith. Uh, my challenge to him would be, in my particular definition, did I beg any important questions? Did I use a definition that is, favors my conclusion? I would like to be shown how. Uh, in fact, uh, even when you're appealed to Hebrews 11, 1, I think you have to look at the context there. The writer of Hebrews is not saying that you throw the, your brains out the door. In fact, the whole point of the book of Hebrews, it appeals back to the past experiences, and, and primarily of Abraham. Now, we may disagree upon whether that, those events actually happened. But be careful here, because you don't want to beg the question. Don't presume that these things did not happen without showing why naturalism is true. To do so, he begs the question in favor of naturalism. How much time do I have? About two minutes. About two minutes. Um, one final point in terms of practical, practicality. I would agree that there have been abuses of faith. In fact, uh, in my closing argument, I'll, I'll talk about what makes faith virtuous. But let me say this. I would greatly, con once again, concede that people have used faith in abusive ways. And I don't think that's what the biblical, uh, in terms of scripture or theologically, that kind of faith is endorsed by most theologians and most biblical scholars. Um, but let's not forget, uh, we can talk about all the bad things that religion has done, people of faith have done. But how many hospitals have they been built by atheists? How many universities? I can think of maybe one or two universities. In fact, most of the universities in this country were started by churches. Why? Because they value the intellectual life. And like I said, this goes, this goes hand in hand with my earlier point that in fact, when you look at the history of philosophy, and I would, you can stand for a number of other disciplines as well, including science. I can't think of a single scientist, there may be one or two out there, in terms of the beginning of modern science, that were atheists. And in fact, most of the great early scientists 
not only were theists, but it, it was their theist commitment that gave them the confidence that the world was intelligible and that we can trust our sense perceptions. But you'll notice in all my quotes, I never quoted once an apologist. I quoted philosophers, and most of whom are naturalists. So I'm going to take the word over somebody like John Searle or Patricia Churchland over Homer Simpson. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I have to do um, I have to do quite a few things. I have to respond to his open statements, uh, but I think it's more important actually to respond to his response to my open statement. So first of all, he said that um, Mike said that his definition of faith was just fine, and um, and I think it is not consistent because he is conf he, he is really trying to merge this idea of of using reason uh, and trust. <coughs> With unfounded belief in, in some things, and um, to say that the um, that the belief in a supernatural being is on par with trust in in, in the scientific method just doesn't wash. So I can I can I can perform experiments, scientific experiments every day, and that confirms my trust in the scientific method. I cannot test the hypothesis uh, of the existence of a god. So my trust in the existence of God. Um, is untestable. And so there's a fundamental difference of these two notions of faith. And you have just one given, given one definition of faith and conflated these, both, these two meanings. And I think that is just, um, that's just not valid. So then, you accuse me of a hominem attack and said, I quoted Homer Simpson. Simpson. Well, if, if you remember, it wasn't me who brought up Homer Simpson. It was the Catholic Church. It was the Vatican. And I quoted them. Okay. So, uh, complain with the Pope and, 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 and his, <laughs> his, his people, okay? So, I, I was saying it's ridiculous to talk about Homer Simpson and, and actually look, any quotes and any, any um, meanings to, to Homer Simpson. They are fictional characters. All right, uh, let's see here. You've talked about <coughs> controversy in, uh, in, in science and that um, not everybody in science agrees with one another. That is true. Actually, I think that's the hallmark of science that we have discussion. Right? When you go to a conference and somebody comes up with a new idea, you should see the discussions. I mean, this is really uh, at the heart of science. A controversy is welcome. And over the long run, controversy in science leads to progress. Now, if you look to what uh, at controversy in religion, most of the time it leads to war and death. Right? There's no progress there. For thousands of years, people have had uh, contradictory views of religions. Uh, my God is better than your God. How can you test this? There's no way. With science, you can test one hypothesis against another. The one that is better at explaining things wins. So, um, philosophy of science. You, you mentioned that. So I don't really remember exactly what you say there. Uh, said there, um, but. Um, I think you can just go into, instead of going here, you mentioned go to the bookstore and get book, uh, uh, copies of books or books of, about philosophy or science. I think you should go to the classrooms, or you should go, uh, well, this classroom, the thing that I'm wearing here, that's a contribution of science. Science works. When you fly to some uh, people on the, on the East Coast while using a plane, engineering science works. Um, science and engineering has, uh, have contributed to our society numerous things and they have proved themselves uh, working. Theology has not produced anything uh, of that kind. So I don't think you can compare the two. Measuring in science. You, you mentioned um, that um, in science we not, and you, you criticize empiricism right, in science, and, and that we can't work just measure everything. We have to use numbers and mathematics. I agree. Um, but measurement in science is based uh, it's based first and foremost off um, of sense data. We start by observing with our senses, seeing, hearing, touching. And then later, once we have understanding of our senses, how they work, that they trust, that they are trustworthy in providing data that we can uh, use to build theories that can predict how nature works, well then we build machines, telescopes, other machines that extend our senses. So it's not that there's some kind of magic that is um, that is beyond um, 
um, beyond our senses is really just an extension of that. <coughs> See. Yeah, we talked about numbers and that numbers are abstract ideas. Now, I would, um, numbers are abstract things that I agree with. But there's a, it is not clear and people disagree on whether numbers are, um, exist abstractly and independent of our reality or not. And there are very many people who think that numbers are just abstractions that resulted from concrete observations. So I recommend, I really don't recommend books in such a setting, but um, there's a nice book by George Lakoff and, and Johnson about um, where mathematics comes from. And they explain very nicely how from our observations in the world, from our experience with space and time, numbers, mathematics has evolved. And so, were the universe of a different kind, well, maybe a different mathematics would have uh, evolved. So I would, I would subscribe to that, and I don't think mathematics is an abstract realm that exists independent of our observations. The burden of proof. Um, you said, I have to, or, or science has to prove that it's correct or something like that, and um, I, no, this is, you said something else. Um, I wrote on burden of proof. Well, I think, the, the thing is this, um, scientific claims um, prove themselves every day, and if they and if they fail, um, if they fail, well, uh, hypothesis get rejected. And uh, whereas um, when when you claim that the existence of transcendental things like souls, um, well, gods, whatever, you have no proof of that. So when you make that claim, you have to you have to provide us with. With, uh, with a proof and not ask the scientists to disprove uh, your claim. Then you said um, that atheists have never built a hospital. Well, um, maybe you know that Bill Gates is an atheist, and so is Warren Buffett. And uh, I think these are the, the two most, uh, the people who donated most in the United States um, to um, charitable um, uh, purposes, and so there are many other people. The thing is, atheists are not in the spotlight because they are really loath in this country. And um, <laughs> um, the other thing is, there are, there are doctors, the, 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 the organization Doctors Without Borders who do great things. So, and then um, I actually acknowledge the fact that, um, that in the name of faith, uh, good things have happened. I acknowledge that. I grant you that. Right? So you can't attack me on this. But I said that this is not an argument against um, the futility of faith in, in, in its ability to gain any truth. And I take the, uh, the definition of faith as belief without uh, evidence, which I think is the proper definition of faith in the context of religious beliefs. Let's see, I have two minutes. Okay, so. Um, let's see. Yeah, so in your opening, in your opening statements, um, you talked about three commitments of, um, of the atheists or secularists with respect to metaphysical materialism. Um, and so, well, that is not necessarily the case. Um, I would subscribe, for example, to something like um, pragmatic naturalism. So I can stand here and say, well, 